So to, so to make this the first conversation in question very, um, very intimate, I, I'd like to ask you a, a, a personal question, which is um, personalization, I, I would say, if, if you go to more conferences over the year, it's, it's, it's a little bit like high school sex. Uh, a lot of CMOs talk about it, uh, but very few actually do it well. And so in that sense, you know, really, in your experience, you've been with AT&T, you've been with GoDaddy, you've been many places, you're now with 1-800-CONTACTS. What are the building blocks of a great personalized experience? That was uh, an interesting way to ask the question. <laughs> um, and obviously, the only building block you really need is Sunday Sky personalized video. Um, no, so. Um, thank you, thank you. That was, that was not. There you go, that's the shill. Unpaid, um, look. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Having been in, in a lot of different industries, massive companies, medium-sized companies, now small company, um, what I've discovered, yes, the building blocks, everybody's gonna sort of approach the building blocks differently, but I think what's more important for all of this is starting with the foundation, which sounds like a great builder analogy. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, starting with a foundation grounded in the customer experience and grounded in the end-to-end -end customer experience, not just the bits that are digital, not just the bits that are in your department, not just the bits that uh, are on your annual goals, but really looking at that end-to-end -end customer experience and, and identifying every single time that you touch a customer, whether it's a pixel or a human being or some other type of impression, is an opportunity to make an impression and to uh, bring that customer closer to your brand. Um, you have to instrument it. Generally, bringing in those digital tools and the tools of, of personalization um, are the places where you can really make it um, really make it sing, and that's why a lot of companies tend to focus on it because what you can get there is the consistency of experience that you don't necessarily get with a human touch point. You get the 24/7 side of things. You can bring the data side of it, but where I've seen, um, in my experience, where things have really gone to the next level is when you start to connect the dots to those non-digital touch points and actually bring personalization into those experiences too. And you say, well, how do you bring personalization into a human-to-human -human interaction? Well, that's where you start to take those same tricks, those same tools, the same insights and analytics and real-time personalization that you would bring into a digital touch point and use it to empower those human-to-human -human touch points as well. So everything that you're doing, say, in a personalized video, right? Um, and at AT&T, we started with using the personalized video bill, which was an incredibly powerful um, experience for our customers. What we found was, gee, if we could actually empower an agent with that same type of content, mm -hmm. they could actually create a better experience than they're doing when they're reading off of the desktop saying, all right, I'm toggling between multiple screens and now I can finally answer your question. If you can empower your agents, if you can empower your retail um, experience, as well as what you're doing in the digital side of things, and you're really creating something that is unique for customers and they feel it. So yes, it's, you know, it, you're starting with those building blocks, you're setting the example in the digital experience, um, but don't lose sight of all those other opportunities you have to bring a personalized experience to a customer. And so you know, to that point, you know, Kelly mentioned before where United is in, in their journey, and she's looking up at a mountain, she's looking down below, she's like, wow, I've come really whoa, that far, but I still have that far to go. So uh, it's, it's not all, as, as um, Russell Brand might say, it's not all pink unicorn shit and glitter. Um, the, the, the obstacles, <laughs> I'm just, we're just gonna, where does it keep coming up with fun ones? It's, it's, the, it's exactly, it's, that's how we work. Um, the, the, the biggest obstacles a brand faces when trying to implement a personalization strategy today, like how would you counsel companies? You, you've, 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 been, you've been to the mountain, you've been to the top of the mountain in, in a few different scenarios. How do you counsel them to, in terms of prioritizing their, their personalization initiatives? Um, this is gonna sound simple and mundane, but um, if you've really instrumented all those different touch points, um, frankly, start with the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's interesting is generally those biggest touch points, those biggest points of interaction you have with a customer are something that's fairly mundane. And on the surface, and I'll give you an example, you know, checking minutes back when people didn't have unlimited minutes on cell phones. An incredibly mundane thing, right? What are you gonna do to personalize that? Well, frankly, if you use that, in a past life, we used that touch point, which was an incredibly 
um, incredibly huge touch point that we weren't doing anything to personalize and just start to surround it. Every time that we had that interaction, we'd be able to put up one additional bit of content that would generally be something, could be something as simple as just a message saying, here's how you get a better experience out of your handset to something that's a lot more about personalizing, getting somebody to the next level of engagement, meaning an upsell or a personalized sale or a personalized service message that would then have something that's PL impacting. So starting with those, uh, th those high velocity touch points, look, it may not always yield something, but starting with that at least starts to get the wheels turning in your head to say, okay, what could I do with this? And it doesn't have to be something incredibly complicated and powerful. It can be just something as simple as versioning with something that's one iteration better than having nothing there, mm -hmm. learning from that, and then getting that flywheel going and adding more and more and more to it. And the people involved, so Nick talked earlier about you know, the video teams that are small but mighty, uh, personalization teams, and that we are, to, to an effect, all personalization champions in, mm -hmm. in some respect. Uh, what are some of the, the departments and resources in, you know, wh whether it be, you know, sprawling organization like, like AT&T, maybe slightly less sprawling organization in a, in a GoDaddy that, that, are, that are involved in that. So you understand the touch point, great. Now I want to personalize that, great. How does that go upstream into the organization? Yeah, look, it, it, um, obviously the, the holy grail is you're involving anybody who touches customers um, and getting them on board. And frankly, um, having a North Star, having a vision that you can get everybody who touches customers to at least understand that, hey, look, we may not get to you tomorrow, we may not even get to you two years from now, but you're part of this and getting people to be able to participate in it. That's something that's gonna pay dividends in the long run as you start to take you know, a nugget of success in personalization in one touch point and expand it throughout the enterprise. Um, so that's important to do even if you're not gonna get to it immediately. But obviously, having a great relationship with the keepers and owners of your data um, that, and, and it's better than having a good relationship, meaning you like each other and you go to lunch and you don't snipe at each other in, in meetings and things like that. Um, something that um, I think was, was sort of a breakthrough for me um, when I was at GoDaddy was you know, building a personal relationship with our CTO um, who brought in some of the best data scientists um, in the business and working with her and her team from day one when we were ideating where we could take the company in terms of building out a personalized end-to-end -end experience, getting them on board, getting them to understand why we were doing it. We were not doing it because the end state was not to build a Hadoop data lake that we could all access with unified data that was cleansed in real time <laughs> and that we could then you know, go and build machine learning on top of. That, that's, the, that's the marketing statement written by an engineer, I think? Is that right. Yeah. The, explaining to them in customer terms. And, and actually, this is, I mean, this is kind of we ex how we explain it. The reason that we're doing all this stuff is because at the end of the day, we want our customers to have a phenomenal experience because we love them. We're doing it because we love our customers. And getting the data team to understand that there was a context there, that the reason that they were doing all that work, and yes, we would have good things like KPIs around new customer acquisition and you know, revenue growth and EBIT and all those good things. But at the end of the day, we're doing it because we love our customers and we want them to have an end-to-end -end experience that makes them understand that we're there for them, we love them, we want them to be, to be successful. Having that context in terms of why they were doing the work ended up yielding some pretty interesting things. So yes, did we get our big data lake? Yes. Did we get some phenomenal machine learning algorithms? Did we go from one version of our homepage to three million versions in six months? Yes, we did all that good stuff, but the results that we got from them were much more meaningful to customers and to the firm because we had the data scientists coming to, uh, you know, they'd come to our merchandising team and say, hey, I, we noticed that you guys were doing this thing in the flow. And, you know, that's not really the best customer experience, but we figured out this thing in the data that if we could change these things around, it'll actually have a better result for us and the customers will probably show, you know, that they like it through higher NPS scores. And sure enough, that stuff works. So, um, yes, you got to get your data people on board, but get them on board with the right mission um, versus just getting into all the wonky speak, which they'll do all that stuff. That's what they do. That's what they went to school for and that's what you hired them for. But, but framing it in that mission and centering it around the customers, um, uh, I, I, it just, it, it works. 
Jim mentioned uh, at the, in his opening session a couple of curious facts about uh, at least video consumption, smart video consumption, and millennials, Gen Xers, and people with household incomes. And, and, and you mentioned it in terms of the data science team at GoDaddy. Uh, are there any, any either curious correlations or spurious correlations that, uh, that, you, can, that you can share from, from that experience? Things that, things that, like your data scientists, they came to you with, hey, did you know that people who sign up for websites are 26 times more likely to own a gray Volkswagen, or who knows what. That's the exact insight <laughs> they came up with. And we said, but we don't sell Volkswagens. How's that going to help us? Um, the, uh, actually, you know, it's interesting when uh, Jim mentioned that. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of pivot your question. Um, Jim was mentioning that this morning. Is actually, um, uh, when, when we were talking about the notion of trust in the Forrester presentation. I was reading an article actually this morning, um, one of those uh, articles I get in my inbox, showing um, the importance with uh, Gen Z and millennials around doing business uh, with brands that they trust, with brands that actually have a point of view on things and have um, transparency. And it's not just transparency in terms of I'm fair and I disclose my terms and conditions, it's transparency in terms of who you are and what you're there to do for them. And I think, as we've seen with things like privacy breaches and all the, the, the controversy and debate right now around, um, I mean, look, everybody in this room is working on personalization. And it, you know, more than ever, it's important to businesses. And more than ever, it's something that um, consumers and regulators are actually looking at. And we can all thank Facebook for that. right? People are actually paying attention to it. It used to be, oh, yeah, isn't that interesting that pair of shoes is following me around the internet? Um, now it's, isn't that interesting? It parachutes is following me around the internet. I wonder what else they're doing. Um, there is a, a um, it, it's kind of a, a, it doesn't make any sense because consumers don't make any sense at the end of the day. But on the one hand, yes, I'm going to open up all my information to you and Gen Z and millennials in particular have no problem. I see it with my, my daughters. They'll just sign anything over to any provider. Well, yeah, so what if they're tracking to me? What does it matter? Where it matters, and this is where the data is becoming clearer and clearer because there are more studies being done around people's uh, perceptions around personalization and data because of it, it, it's a hot item in the news now, is it does matter when, um, at the end of the day, do people feel that the brands are misusing the data and not personalizing for my benefit in a way that I can actually trust what you're doing for me, that you're do what you're doing for me is in my best interest, that it's surprising and delighting me, versus you're doing it because you're selling to me. And when you cross that line, when consumers feel that they're being sold to and they're noticing it more and more, uh, that's where, where um, I think it's important for all of us to be mindful. That's the beauty, I think, of, um, of digital video, personalized video, is you're able to create a richer experience that if we're focusing on something that's useful to customers, something that's in their best interest, you're not just going to get that transactional benefit. Yeah, you'll shed a call, and yeah, you'll convert the cart, but you're actually starting to build more of a relationship between the brand and the consumer, and um, I, I think that the data is showing that's more and more important. Yes, with, with a generation that's looking more at the brands that they want to associate with, but I, I think it's going to start to apply more and more to the general population. So uh, associating with 1-800-CONTACTS, so, so Phil has been in New York for two days. He's been at 1-800-CONTACTS uh, now for two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, and so, an right, so ho hopefully this will be, we haven't, we haven't cleared this next question with, uh, with le legal and PR. No, I'm kidding. But personalization lessons that you've learned from your experiences and how, how do you plan to apply them at 1-800-CONTACTS? Uh, at um, yeah, I, I think um, so this is my fifth industry now, um, and it's the one that I, I it's one of the ones where I, I'm probably the most excited just because um, as, as personal as it is, you know, and I enjoy it and love my time selling these things, um, it, I think what you, what you do with your vision care is a lot more personal, and as the largest online vision care company in the country, uh, we have a great opportunity to continue the personalized experience, not just in terms of uh, of getting your contacts and serving your customers, which is something that the, as a company we are incredibly passionate about. Um, people do come into work every day loving customers, which is why we have a phenomenal net promoter score and, and our customers uh, seem to love us. But 
as we look at all the opportunities around the vision care um, space, as we bring in things like online vision exams, which we offer, as we start to expand the, the range of, of offers that we have, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to use personalization in our case, not just to make sure that you get your right product and that we're able to help you make sure that your vision is cared for, that your eyes are healthy, um, but also make sure that our content is out there educating people. There's a lot, I mean, just show a hands in the room, how many people are, you don't have to even, there's many people in the room, I'm looking around, have some sort of vision correction right now. Um, it's not just the glasses, but because I'm at 1-800 contacts, I can see everybody is wearing contacts. <laughs> um, I am, I am, I'm actually, a, a, a legally, I'm an optometrist in the state of Utah. That's a fact. <laughs> um, but um, beyond just the vision correction, um, how many people are signing up for vision care plans through their companies generally? Those VSP things, right? How many times when you go to your eye doctor is the doctor sitting down with you and really discussing all of your options for your vision care? Saying, you know, there's a, you're in this contact right now, but there's actually three other kinds, and we may want to discuss the right kind for you. Um, I doubt there's going to be any hands that come up. There, there are a lot of questions about your vision care that are not being necessarily answered um, in your best interest. Uh, it's because it's an old school industry. It's an old school industry that is ripe for disruption and disruption in, on behalf of customers. So when you have that combination of opportunities, um, it, to me, it, it's, it's a responsibility that we have to our customers to use personalization to get them the right information at the right time so they can understand what a vision care plan does or doesn't do for you and that it's really just a prepaid plan. It's actually not insurance. So people can understand that they actually do have choices with their own vision that it's not just something that you receive passively, it's something that you actually need to be involved in just like you'd be involved in weight loss, just like you'd be involved in cholesterol care or diabetes care. This is something that's important to you. So in this case, yes, we're, as we start to introduce personalization, upgrade our technologies, take our, our stack into a state where we can actually start to propagate content where and when we need to for customers, um, yes, we'll certainly, it'll help us in terms of our, our P&L KPIs, but really it's about getting content to our customers at the right time so they can make informed decisions on their own behalf because it's their eyes. Um, so that's how uh, we look to do it. And, and really, you know, again, it starts with, to my first point, um, fundamentally sitting down and saying, okay, every time we cus touch customers, how can we be more, how we, can we create a more powerful impression how can we make them understand that they can trust us, that we're there to help them, that we have the right information every single time that we touch them, whether it's a pixel or a human being. And that's, that's the approach that we're taking at GoDaddy, um, uh, uh, GoDaddy at 1-800, um, a little easier uh, because we're smaller. Mm -hmm. um, last question, which is, if you had to write the job description for the chief personalization officer of the future, what, would it, what might it look like? Um, he's not springing that on me. It's been on this list of questions, and I've been noodling on this one. I've rewritten this one about 10 times because um, it's, it's, it's an incredibly loaded question. Um, I was hoping she wasn't going to put anything down that I was going to be saying or trying to colors. Um, I, I think fundamentally, um, and, and I've had similar roles like that, um, although the titles have changed over the years, right? It used to be chief experience officer and chief digital officer, chief personalization officer. I think what's key with any of, any of you in those roles, any of us in those roles, is first and foremost, um, particularly at larger companies, making sure that the role is not a role that's been put in place because, say, the CMO and the CIO can't get along and can't talk to each other and get work done. There's a lot of those types of jobs and a lot of chief personalization. I have friends who are chief personalization officers who are in really, really difficult jobs because the job description um, was vague. And then once they got into the role, they really realized that their job is to help the organization work together because they're not working together. Um, so Chief conciliation officer. Yeah, basically. And I guess, you know, it's either hire a chief personalization officer or, or get an agency to try to work out your org problems. Um, but... <laughs> I think at the heart of it, um, the heart of the job description has to come down to helping the organization 
uh, you know, and again, it just come back to help any organization have a passion for its customers and, and really keeping the organization grounded in the customers. And I think if you start with that grounding and that vision, the technology stuff um, beco just becomes a lot more easy. Mm -hmm. it, it really does. It puts a framework around why you're doing the technology, why your roadmap looks the way it does, why you're choosing to do this thing now versus later on, and why you're asking for the money that you're asking for the systems that you don't have. Um, I, I think about the times I sat down, you know, at, at AT and T with the chairman of the company, saying, you know, this is what we're trying to do. This is why we're doing it. It's all about the customers and what we can do. And imagine how powerful that's going to be when we do it. And, and creating that vision, guess what? The budget just flowed. Mm -hmm. We never even had to ask for it at that point because there was an understanding of the vision from the very, very top of the organization and a belief that what we were going to be, what we were doing, could be done. And uh, that's what made it a lot easier at the end of the day. So um, if your chief personalization officer and your job is about the technology uh, and it's not framed in terms of the customers, um, you know, first two weeks in the job take, <laughs> or three weeks in the job, take the opportunity to rewrite bits of your job description to, uh, to make sure that it's not just about buying a bunch of uh, technology from vendors and putting it in place. Um, so that you have that context and that framework so that when you're bringing in things like, like a personalized video, you're, you're bringing the best product you can to market because you know why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what to put in that, in that video that's gonna be super useful for customers so that they trust your brand and they wanna have a relationship with your brand.